Hello and welcome. Thank you for tuning in to the Tobago Festivals Network. I am Raynell and I'll be hosting this episode of the Blue Food Step-by-Step -step series where we teach you to make local dishes made with dashin, taro root, blue food, step-by-step. -step. Today I'm joined by Miss Stacy Herbert. Stacy, thank you for joining us. Tell us what you'll be mixing up for us in the kitchen today. Well, today I am going to show you how to make dashin wine step by step so at the end of this episode you'll be able to make one for yourself and at the end of this episode i'll be going home with one for myself <laughs> stay with us this is the tobago festivals network six pounds of sugar because I'm making three ga gallons of wine now when you're making wine right the recipe calls for if you want to make approximately 12% alcohol then you should start with two gal two pounds of sugar per gallon right we are using white sugar because we don't want the influence of the taste in brown sugar to be in the wine it's very important that you do that you don't want that to be competing with the flavor of your wine Right? Because dasheen is not a, a very strong flavor, brown sugar definitely will mask it. Right? So we're using white sugar for that purpose. But I want it to be exactly 12% or 12% in alcohol, which I will test, of course, after. But um, in order to make sure that you have standardization in your recipe, also, it is very important that you note what you would have done because you don't want to make a wine and then say oh gosh this thing nice boy and then you can't duplicate it because you don't know what you did you don't remember what you did yeah so this part is extremely important um your measurements very very important so we're going to put it into the bucket now right we're going to put that in first yeah so we have our six um our six pounds of sugar in so after that now we're going to add a the other ingredients. So let me just put things back together here, clear my counter space, and then we'll come back to that. Meanwhile, the dashing is boiling. We have to test it in a moment to see if it's ready. Um, when you're boiling your dashing, you want it to get tender enough that a fork could go through, or if you have bamboo skewers or a fex, long time we used to use fex, you know, and you just push it, push it through um, so that once it goes through without any resistance, then you know that your dashi in cook so it's cooked right all right so this could go just a little more in about the next two minutes or so it should be ready if you notice we would have covered the dashi in with water the dashi in pieces with water it's very important that you do that because this water is very important in the creation of your recipe this is where you're getting your dashi in flavor we're not going to put the pieces in the in the bucket that we're fermenting with this dashin, in fact, you could use it to do anything else you like. You could use it to make a dashin punch, or maybe you want to make some dashin fritters or something. But you could use the dashin after. The thing that we're retaining for our recipe is the water. So as I said, give it a minute more, and then we'll come back to it. So now that we have finished weighing the sugar, we have six pounds of sugar to three gallons of liquid. That's what we're going to use. That's our recipe for, for today. For every single gallon of, of, of liquid that you add in, you add two pounds of sugar, right? Two pounds would give you approximately 12% alcohol. Yes, so six pounds of sugar here. So we're going to add it to the bucket and then dissolve it. So now we're pouring it in. Oh, already weigh the sugar. To leave even a grain inside a grain left is a little less alcohol you know that's important right so we're going back to check on the dashing right to make sure that it's cooked and then we're going to pour off the liquid from it Ooh. yes so the dashing is just about ready as soon as i put the put it in it just went right through without any resistance at all so you see it's cooked 
right now. Yeah? Yes, all the pieces are yes, all the pieces are cooked. Nice. Right, perfect. So now we're just gonna take take the stove off and then we're going to strain the water out from in it into the bucket that we would have added the sugar. So we're gonna use a strainer. Rest it over the bucket. And we're just going to nicely. So now we have all the water out. Yeah, so this dashing could be used to do something else. We might need some fish and dashing or something later. We ain't sure yet. Right? So now we have this water in here. Now this is very hot, right? Um, but we want we want this to come up to to three gallons, right? But what we're gonna do, since the water is warm, it would make it easier to dissolve the sugar anyway. So we're gonna use this opportunity to dissolve the sugar. And then we'll use fresh water to bring the water up to where you want it, to the three gallon mark. Now we would have previously measured this bucket so we know where it's going to be. Three gallons will take us, right? So I'm using a wooden spoon because especially when you're using plastic buckets, right? Um, it's very important that you use a, a wooden spoon. If you're using metal spoons, what happens when you're stirring, sometimes you, you scrape the bottom of the bucket and you have plastic coming out in it, right? So you don't want that if you stir too hard, right? So you don't want that. So normally, I would use a wooden spoon. I recommend that you use a wooden spoon when you're doing that. This is very viscous right now. Um, the viscosity comes from both the, the, the starchiness from the dashing and also from the sugar. But by adding water, the viscosity will change and in addition to that, the temperature will change, right? Which is very important for when you're adding back your yeast. You don't want the water to be too hot because too much heat kills yeast. Especially for wine yeast, they're very temperature sensitive, yeah? So it's very important that the temperature of, of, your, of your mus, which is what you would call the mixture of your, your, your sugar and your, all the ingredients, you would call that the must, M-U-S-T. Right? It's important for your must to not be very high temperature. Yeah, so we're adding water and bringing it up to the three gallon mark. If you have a bucket that you're, not, that you're using and you're not certain as regards how much it, it, it holds, as regards water, it's very important that you check that first. Right? Find a way to check your, your measurements as it comes to water. It's very important that you do. That will skewer the amount of alcohol you have. If you put too much, if, I mean, you, you, you added two pounds of sugar per gallon, right? And if you put more than three gallons, then you would end up with less alcohol, which you may not want. Or if you put um, not enough, you understand, you get a higher amount of alcohol. So it's very important, your, your, your recipe is very, very important, and measurements. All right, so we're right at the three gallon mark. So at this point, we're gonna stir it again make sure that there's nothing there if you notice if you look in the bucket you'll see the viscosity would have changed it's not as um as viscous as it was before right at this point what i'm going to do if you have a hydrometer this is the point if you have a hydrometer this is the point where you would check to see your potential alcohol if you don't it's fine right you still it still will come out but um it's just that you're you're kind of averaging Right? So my assistant is just rinsing my utensils here and we'll check that. So we're pouring the liquid in and we're going to see where where the liquid would have cut the 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 line of the alcohol of the of the hydrometer. So that will tell you basically your potential alcohol. Go ahead. Go again. Alright. So it's floating. Right? So it's exactly on 12% potential alcohol. So 10 there and 1, 2, 12. So we know that we would have kept 
our measurements intact, we know everything okay. We have exactly 12% potential alcohol, right? So what we do now is pour this back into the bucket with the rest of your. Now, making wine, according to the French, right? What we do is not wine, right? But we are people who use what we have to get what we want. And dashin is what we have, so we're using dashin to make what we want, right? And we call it wine, right? So in making um, wine, in order to, dashin wine in particular, in order to get your wine clear, it's very important that you get your wine nice and crystal clear looking, right? If you do not focus on certain things, your wine will end up cloudy. It doesn't matter what you, it will end up cloudy. Starch is one of the things that we have to focus on when we're making dashin wine because dashin is very starchy. Cassava is the same thing. You have to focus on these things, else you're going to get your wine, um, a wine that is cloudy. The thing that you use to break down starch in winemaking is something called amylase. It's, an, it's a chemical that, is, that breaks down starch in fermentation, right? Amylase, right? So what we're going to do now is add amylase. There's no substitution for amylase in winemaking if you're making a starch wine, right? So we're going to add in amylase in order to make sure that we have a nice clear white wine because at the end of the day, this is what we want, right? So the measurement for amylase is half teaspoon, right? For every um, bucket of wine you're making. For, for one to five gallons of wine you're making, you're using half teaspoon only in the bucket, right? So we're going to add that now. All right, so this is my half teaspoon measurement. I put it in, I level it, and I just add it in, right? So now that you're adding your amylase now, now, in order for a wine to be balanced, you have to have a, a mixture of acidity and astringency, right? Acidity, you know what acidity is, right? Um, but astringency is that mouth feel that you get in wine. Or in anything you eat, like cashews. If you're eating cashews, you know that kind of thing that's getting your mouth kind of, a kind of staininess, that is astringency, right? We're gonna add acid, first thing, right? So the measurement for acidity in wines that, that are not grape is one to two teaspoons of acid for every gallon of wine that you're making, right? So we're making um, three gallons of wine, so we're gonna add six teaspoons. Six teaspoons because dashin is not acidic, right? If you was using, if you're doing maybe some kind of fruit, passion fruit, and it had high acid, then you would add less. You would add one teaspoon or one and a half teaspoon. But for this purpose, for this wine, we're gonna use two teaspoons for every gallon of wine. So we're gonna add six teaspoons of acid blend. Um, if you don't have acid blend, then you can feel free to use lemon juice or lime juice, right? That's a very good substitution for it, right? Um, so six level teaspoons. One, two, three, four, five, six. Lovely. Right. So I was just talking about astringency, right? And astringency, as I said, is that mouth feel, right, in wines. So commercially, they sell something called wine tannin. It's made from, usually from the skins and seeds of grapes because that is also astringent. If you eat a grape seed or you bite a grape seed, if you notice what happens, your mouth kind of pucker kind of way, that is what you're looking for, yeah? So this is commercial wine, wine tannin, but if you don't have this, you can use, maybe have some cashews, you could use some cashews in it, or you could use leaves, bay leaf. Leaves naturally has tannins in them, right? So you could use those things. Um, of course, they will influence the flavor of it, but no problem when you're doing your wine, you know. Just think about what you could kind of mix and match and balance and create interesting flavors, right? Um, you could use a tea bag also because, you know, tea bags made out of leaves, right? So you could use that also, right? So we're going to add tannin. And to make a, a, a white wine, we're going to add a quarter teaspoon of tannin for every single gallon of wine that we're going to make, right? So that is three quarter teaspoons, right? So three quarter teaspoons. 
One. Two. Three. Lovely. Thank you, assistant. Right. So we're almost to the end of it. So now I'm going to add yeast nutrient. Yeast nutrient is basically food for the yeast. Besides sugar, um, the, yeast, the yeast needs something to feed on. Long time when you're making wine, we used to use bread yeast, and sometimes the fermentation stops before it complete, it's completed, and that's usually because the yeast doesn't have anything to use, right? So what they do now is they created something called yeast nutrient, and you add it to it, right? Um, you can get a little bit of yeast nutrient also in, in, the, in grapes, in grape skins, you could also get a little bit of yeast nutrient also in bread. Long time you toast a piece of bread and put it in. That also helps, right? But for our purpose now, we're going to use yeast nutrient, right? So the measurement for yeast nutrient is one teaspoon of yeast nutrient for every gallon of wine you're making. So we add in three teaspoons. Lovely. Thank you, assistant. He's very, very helpful. Right. So now we're almost to the end of it here. Right. So we'll give this a little stir. Right. All those things that we just added in, we're giving it a little stir. The color would have changed and all of that. There's a light um, tannish brown color right now. Um, if you notice, you'll see bits of this brown thing here. That's actually the tannin. It will dissolve in the fermentation process. So that's fine if it doesn't dissolve totally when you, when you add it in, in, right? Now, our traditional recipes, we would use sometimes a little rice, sometimes a little raisins. Nothing is wrong with that. If you have your traditional recipe, there's nothing wrong with that, right? But what I would advise you to do is to always make sure that you deal with the, the starch in it and you also keep a, a recipe, know exactly what you put. If you put too much sugar, your wine will not ferment out because sometimes, especially if you're using bread yeast, bread yeast does only give you up to 9% alcohol. In a push, you will get 10, right? But with wine yeast, you could have wine yeast that give you up to 18% alcohol, right? But if you put too much sugar, sometimes it's too much sugar for the type of yeast that you're using, right? But for today's purpose, we are going to use Lalvin D47. I use this, I use this yeast particularly because it gives you a white wine, but it also brings out citrusy notes in your, in your wine. Now, I'm going to add, even though, yes, I added um, some, I added, what did I add? Acidity. I want some flavor from lime juice. So what I'm going to do, I'm still going to add two teaspoons of wine, um, lime juice, just for that flavor. I want to kind of have that little nice citrusy taste in the back of the dashing. Now, when I think about wine, I think about art and the whole thing is art and, and, and interesting things, you understand? So which is why I would put different things in the back that may not be as strong as the first thing, which would be the dashing. But you always wonder, what is that? I tasting something. What is that? That is good boy. You understand? And it's very important that you, you do things like that. That actually creates dimension and it also makes your wine interesting over mine. Maybe more interesting than mine. All those things that you add in. The rice or the, the, the raisins or all those things. All those things add a different dimension. Right? So now I am going to ask my assistant to... Um, cut a lime and squeeze some so that I could have two teaspoons that I'm going to add to this recipe and then I'm going to add the yeast. So now I am going to add my lime juice. I would have said before I'm going to add two teaspoons of lime juice because of the type of yeast that I'm using which is Lalvin D47. I want it to have a little citrusy note in the background. So I'm going to add two teaspoons of lime juice, freshly squeezed lime juice, not bottled lime juice eh? freshly squeezed lime juice and that will be in the background of the wine right so now that i've done that i'm just going to give it a little stir and then i am going to add my yeast which is the, the final step 
in the wine making right so it's a dry um, yeast you do not um, add water to it or anything like that before you just could pour it in right and now I have poured it in on the surface an easy way to make to know that your, your, your yeast is good I should say is that when you put it on the surface it would immediately start to spread before you even do anything it just starts to spread if you notice that it it's staying in one spot or something like that know that something wrong with your yeast it's lazy something wrong with it right so once you would have put it in and it start to spread one time you know your yeast good right so we have done that so we're just going to give it a little stir again and now we're just going to cover this and put it in a nice cool area because as i said oh there's some report there right um in a cool area because yeast is temperature sensitive right um it's very important that you put it in a cool area else you could actually cause your um fermentation to stop while it's happening and you don't ferment all properly and you're wondering why this wine so sweet still you know so yes so we, we're adding on the cover, we're putting the cover on, a tightly fitting cover, but if you notice on this bucket cover, there's a hole on it, right, that we have a little grommet, a rubber grommet in it. Now, in fermentation, this is very important, there must be a space for the, um, for the gas to come out. Fermentation, when fermentation happening, carbon dioxide is generated. So you have to get it out, else your bucket could explode, you know, and we don't want that to happen. So you put something in place so that the gas could come out. Now we have something called an airlock or a fermentation trap, right? What you do is that you put a little water, this is what it looks like when it's together, right? You can buy it at any winemaking supply store, you could buy it online. If you're in Tobago, you could go to TLH building, unit number seven and you could purchase these or any of the things that you need for wine making right or you could call me you could get get them from me also right so you put some water in it you use ordinary tap water and you fill it up to the line there's a line on it you fill it up to that line right once it's at that line then you take it and you put it down in the hole on the top of the bucket right so when the fermentation happening it will, the, the, the gas will come out. Then you take the cover for it and you put it over the top of it. And that's it. Voila. <laughs> and the text. So it's very important now. Now you need to put on this bucket, you need to have a paper that you would have taped on that says Dasheen wine, the date that you would have set it, right? Dasheen wine, the date you set it, the potential alcohol, the yeast you use, every single thing. You have to put it on this little tab on top here because sometimes you put it in a corner and you forget and you're like, why are you putting this again? And if it tastes real good, you're like, oh gosh, how am I making back this thing? And I don't remember what yeast I used because as I tell you before, the amount of yeast, the type of yeast, sorry, is very, very important. It's very important because it changes the flavor of your wine. Depends on what kind of yeast you use, it gives you a different flavor right so it's very important to note that what you would have done so you put in all of that on top here and then you take your bucket and you put it in a nice cool area where it could ferment usually dashing wine takes between six and nine days to finish ferment right and yeah so you will get your full 12 percent within six to nine days right after that is basically just siphoning siphoning it off sweetening it and age, age in it right so we're going to show you just now how you're going to go through that process of siphoning and sweetening and then bottling yeah okay so now we're at the stage where our wine is basically complete all right so we would have gone through the fermentation stage nine days um, had gone we would have siphoned off after the nine days and we would have left it there to ferment to, um, to age a little bit more because we had our 12% alcohol at that point, right? So now we would have left it aging and we leave it for, actually it would have been three months would have passed, right? 
So we're at the point now where we're deciding, we decided that we're going, to sweet, we're going to sweeten it. Check it first. See if that's what we really like. If we want to maybe change it to medium dry because right now it, it is dry. Um, so we're going to taste it first. See if it's medium, if we like it where it is or if we need to add some more. We're going to ask Raynell what she thinks because we're making this one as a Raynell special, right? So, um, so yeah, so we're going to check it now. We're going to put this up, siphon it off. Siphoning is very important. Very, very important. When you would have, your, your wine would have been going through the aging process, process, sorry, sediment would have dropped in the wine. So there would be a lot of sediment in the bottom, right? You never pour wine from one container to the next. Alcohol is light, right? When you pour, you lose alcohol. So which is why we recommend that you siphon. So you siphon from one bucket to the next. You don't want to lose any of your alcohol, right? So this is what we're going to do at this point. We're going to take out some. We're going to check it on the hydrometer, see where it's at, and just decide what we want to do from there, right? So let's go. Where's my friend Raynell, boy? All right. You are 
my friend Rainel. Look my hair. Hey, yes, you are waiting a long time. So, I want you to taste that thing for you. Mm -hmm. I got at that. I know. <laughs> That's why I invite you. <laughs> so, <laughs> first thing we're going to do, we're going to check it, right? So, we're going to show you where it's at now, right? We're using the hydrometer and we're going to check it to see what the sweetness level is, right? So, the fermentation happened, it finishes here with nice and clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just explain to me again what the hydrometer does. Right, so the hydrometer actually tests your potential alcohol and it also helps in your resweetening, right? So in the, when you decide, when you taste it and you decide, um, listen, the fermentation finish and we at zero, zero when it comes to the amount of sugar in it, right? That means you have your full 12% alcohol because remember okay. I tell you it's 12% I was making, right? Mm -hmm. So it had zero, zero. That means all the sugar ferment out and now it's just alcohol here and the okay. flavoring and all that thing in the background, okay. right? Now, so this hydrometer actually tells you where it's at. If you notice where the, where the meniscus would have cut the, the arm thing, you see 1.00 there, right? So between that 990 and 1.000, that's actually a dry wine. Okay. Dry, okay. right? Okay. So there's no sugar the higher up it goes which means that the hydrometer would have sunk a little bit and it gone down the the lower the hydrometer sink is the drier it is right so this has a little residual sugar in it still right but that would not have been from the sugar that i would have added it probably would have been from the um starch that converts to alcohol it's a lot of chemistry but well yeah, we I, want to go through that as you say that i just want to refresh my chemistry when uh -huh. you refer to the meniscus that right. is the area where the water line Cuts the measurement, right? She remembers she chemistry. I learned something. I get that too. Right. <laughs> right. So now, at this point, you see it here? Yes. This is a dry wine. So what I want you to do now is taste this and tell me if you prefer it dry or if we should add some sugar to it and make it medium. Okay. Right? So we're going to do that now. So my assistant, put this tool safe for me, please. And we're just going to pour... A little bit in here, so Renel will have a taste. Now, look at the clarity of this. Mm -hmm. Look at this. Mm -hmm. This is what you're looking at when you're talking about a dashing wine that do good. You so understand? Earlier you spoke about the cloudiness. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing that this is totally clear. I could, well, I can't see my hand on the other side of it, but I'm seeing straight through almost. Mm -hmm. That means that all the starch, starch has been well dissolved. Converted, yes, and it would have sunk to the bottom of the container in the fermentation process. Okay. Right? So, yeah, smell it. Tell me where you're mm -hmm. smelling. I'm smelling alcohol. I mm -hmm. can't say I'm smelling dashing. Mm -hmm. It smells very strong. Mm -hmm. 12 12.5 is 12%. Right? Mm -hmm. Sweet. It's supposed to be dry, yes. but it tastes sweet. Yeah, there's a little hint of sweetness in it. That's, so that's why I say, sometimes people say, I don't like dry wine. You know, I don't like dry wine. But turns out they don't understand what is dry, and they don't understand what is sweet, and they don't understand what is medium, right? So this has a little sweetness in it and that would have been from the chemistry in the starch converts in the sugar all the sugar would have gone from what we would have done before right but starch in itself converts to sugar and well you would know that you remember yes. that from chemistry yes. yes right so what do you think should i leave it as this is or should i add some more sugar before i answer that question i have to ask is dashing wine supposed to be served chilled or room temperature well it depends on what you like now if okay. it's dry right i usually would like to drink it room temperature mm -hmm. right um if it's sweet i normally chill it a little bit right as this is here now i like to pair it like with fish right yes. it works perfectly when you do fish like if you do a, a fish in fact you could use the same wine mm -hmm. and make a um a sauce with it a wine sauce use coconut and lemon zest and that kind of thing and make a nice thing right and you just see it well i like to do it with greenback cavalli Okay. right and you make a nice little sauce and thing so we mean we get in some of that and dashing later then um we will discuss that after <laughs> right <laughs> yeah so this is what i like it you like it i like it i think 
it doesn't need any more sugar and I would enjoy it chilled or room temperature. This mm -hmm. is excellent. Yeah. This is Main Ridge wine. Main Ridge wines. Mm -hmm. Bloody beef to beef. That's us. I love this flavor. Stacy, show you. All you're good. <laughs> all you're good. All you're good. <laughs> so, Raynell, yes, at this point, what we're going to do is bottle some, right? Because we want to save some for Christmas. You know, if you plan to make gifts with them or what you want to do. I plan to drink them. So you plan to drink them. <laughs> okay, Raynell. Well, whatever you decide to do, we're going to bottle some right now, right? So, I'm going to show you our process of how we, how we, do, it, how we do our bottling. Right? So we use our gravity flow to really basically do the thing, right? Okay. As I would have said before, um, when I was making the wine, what we do is that, we, what we never do is pour. Mm -hmm. We don't pour from one container to the next. We siphon. Everything we do, we siphon. So what we're going to do is that we're gonna add an attachment here I don't know if you know anything about siphoning, the old-fashioned way. No, ma'am. I'm learning. You're learning? Yes. All right, good. Let me show you. It's neat. Right, so you see the flow happening there. Right? So what I'm going to do, because I don't want nothing to waste. Right? So it's blow, you just blow into that? No, I pull. You pull, okay. I just pulled, yeah. Oh yeah, no, not my siphon. Eh? No, 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 no. <laughs> right. We add attachment. Too. Right. So we add this attachment, which is an automatic bottler. Okay. Right. It has a little thing here, so when it rests down in the bottom, mm -hmm. it starts flowing. So we just drop it inside here, and we just unlock this thing that we just locked there. And you see, and things it, start to flow. And it has to be at a certain height. Yes. So if we put it up here, it wouldn't flow good. Nah, too because it's too, too okay. um thing, right? So everything flowing down to the bottom there and falling up. So when was the main ridge brand born? The brand of itself, the rebranding, I should say, happened last year, right? Which would have been 2019, Okay. right? Um, I started thinking more seriously about it. And so I decided to engage a professional to have it done, right? So that was born, the, the rebranding was done in 2019. Okay, and the bottles retail for how much? A hundred dollars. If it's a young wine, it's a hundred dollars. If it's something that I would have aged beyond a year, two years sometimes, because I have wines that are four years old, mm -hmm. right? Um, I would sell them for more, 150 going up, right? Um, yeah. How long is the fermentation process? Okay, fermentation happens, could finish within nine days, if, according to what you're making, mm -hmm. right? Dashing wine tends to ferment within six and nine days, mm -hmm. right? After that is basically aging. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's the, the complete fermentation part. And as I said, after that is aging. So for a regular bottle of young wine that you all would sell, mm -hmm. what is your standard? How long do you leave it to age for? Minimum, minimum six months. Okay. I do not sell wines under six months. Okay. Right. I think they are a little bit too harsh, and I need it to start to marry a little bit more. There are some wines, some fruit wines that can be sold before that time, right? Within three months or so, right? But I prefer to age a little longer. So a young wine, you wouldn't get a wine that is younger than six months from me. Okay, okay. So I can, is it too soon to take my wine out of the freezer, show it? <laughs> no, you want to leave it, let it chill a bit. Leave it, let it chill a bit. Is the way it tastes good, I just want some more. Uh -huh. But I'll wait, I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and if you're making gifts to them, it's important, your presentation is really important. Eh? So if you notice, we would have put a nice little seal on the top, yes. and we're going to shrink it and thing and make it look real sweet and thing. So when you give somebody this, or if you decide that you want to sell it, Okay. Then you're knowing something real about your selling, right? And the presentation, nobody is asking you, a hundred dollars for that? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Presentation. Presentation, right real important. But like I said, this is mine that I'm putting. I finally keep moving it. <laughs> Put it to the side for my Christmas. We still have to fix the presentation. That's all right. Easy open. Easy open. <laughs> easy open, easy open. So this is the Tobago Festival's Network step-by-step -step series after all. Yeah. So I just need to ensure that I have the steps to this dashing wine making process intact. Mm -hmm. So the first step, 
you wash the dashi. Mm -hmm. First, you, you peel your dashi. You peel, you peel it before you wash it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. First thing, you have to wear gloves. Okay. But dashi is a thing, is, especially if you have sensitive hands, causes your hands to scratch. Mm -hmm. Right? So you put on some gloves and you start to peel your dashi. Right? Some people like to scrape it. Right? But I personally prefer to peel it. Mm -hmm. Right? So I peel it, I wash it out. And I cut it up in pieces, nice pieces that you ain't gonna take too long to boil. You mm -hmm. understand? Mm -hmm. And put it to boil. Make sure the water covering it, mm -hmm. right? When the water, when you put it to boil and the water covering it, you test it to make sure that it cook and it's the water that you're using. Mm -hmm. You're not using the food. So you can still eat the food. Yeah, you could eat the food. So that is for the carrot later that we discussed previously okay. <laughs> with the white wine. Continue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How you fix it on this thing so? So yeah, use the water. <laughs> Tell me Stacy. Yes. So after you, you take the water, you separate it, you put it in your bucket with your sugar. Mm -hmm. Right? Now the sugar um, is two pounds of white sugar, granulated sugar, mm -hmm. not brown sugar, because we don't want to influence the taste. Okay. Right? So white sugar, use two pounds of white sugar for every gallon. That is to give you 12% alcohol. Okay. Now it's a standard recipe. A nice table wine. You know table wines are between 9 and 12%, right? Mm -hmm. Good. So, once you would have thrown your water in with, the, with your sugar, the hot water, the same concentrate you made, add it to your sugar, and then you top it up to wherever your mark is for how much wine you're making. Say, for instance, well, I would have made a three-gallon batch, mm -hmm. right? So you bring it up, the water up to the three-gallon mark, stir it up and thing, make sure the sugar dissolves and all of that, and you add in all your little things, all your things, your, your tannin and your your um, acidity and your little lime juice if you want to put a little rice in there or you want to put a little um, raisins whatever mm -hmm. you know to add a little dimension to your thing because as I say wine making is art eh? mm -hmm. it's art right and then when that happens and you put in all your thing and your yeast and whatever you cover it up and you leave it to ferment in a nice cool place not forgetting your airlock okay right Put on your airlock so that the gas could come out. Carbon dioxide is generated during the fermentation to, um, process, so that has to come out, okay. right? Because you don't want your bucket to explode, right? You put your bucket in a nice cool area and you leave it. Like what, um, this thing I was watching a, a short time and they used to say, set it and forget it. <laughs> you know? That's before my time. <laughs> but go ahead. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, so after that um, nine day period, you, you have to check it, okay. right, to make sure that the fermentation would have completed. If you don't have a hydrometer to test, you could do the eye test, right? Look at it, when you open it, you will, if it's still fermenting, you would see some tiny bubbles On in, top. yes, in the liquid there. Okay. If you're seeing that still fermentation still happening, so just cover it back and put it back, Okay. right? When you take that out and you check it and you realize there's none of that happening on the top, taste it at that point. Mm -hmm. Right? You have to taste it because if you do have a hydrometer, you need to know if the fermentation stick or if it really done not ferment. Mm -hmm. Right? So when you taste it, it's supposed to be dry. No sugar. That's what I mean when I say dry. Mm -hmm. No sugar. Mm -hmm. Right? And at that point, you siphon off into a new bucket and if you want to sweeten and thing, and then you could leave it back to age again. Okay. Right? Till however long you want it to age. So this is already bottle i know it's not sealed mm -hmm. it's, it's still my bottle uh -huh. you will seal it it is yeah. from a christmas uh -huh. but this bottle it's already bottled mm -hmm. i take it home if i leave it in my cupboard for mm -hmm. 20 years that contributes to the aging process still yes mm -hmm. okay so i could then resell that for 500 dollars or so uh, well that's after a, some time well, if you want to because you okay. know aging does improve your wine okay. right although there are some things that you can't leave to be too long Okay. All right, because even in, in grape wines, sometimes they get off. You buy a bottle that might be 20 years old, and when you taste it, you're like, Ugh. So how do you know what is too long? When you taste it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that might be a little too late. <laughs> that might be a little too late. Yes, yes. Okay. So, and that's why it's important to balance your wine, eh? When you're starting in the first place, you have to balance it. Because if, it too, uh, if, you, if you didn't do all of that, when you taste that, fall flat yeah okay so you want to make sure that your wine is balanced from the beginning so the next step now is just to seal the caps so yeah just to seal the caps put on your label okay. and that kind of thing whether it's renal special or whatever it is that you want to want to put on now we put on our 
um, low or, or label which says taro, which means dashin, it's yeah. the same thing as dashin mm -hmm. with main ridge wines, mm -hmm. bloody bay, destination point, and all of that, right? Okay, yeah, so whatever you would have done, put it there, put your year, whatever year you would have done it, because that's important too. You want to remember, right? Right, so put your year, your vintage year, okay, and that's it. Okay, beautiful. So let's get to see Lena, yes. So I'm dipping it. Just dipping it in. Into the boiling water. And just take it out back. And that's it. And that's it. Yes. It's ready. Okay. Top notch. <laughs> that's what we talking Professional about. labeling. <laughs> so Stacy, thank you very much. I'm thoroughly enjoying this wine. And thank you for this bottle for my Christmas. Y'all, this has been the step-by-step -step series of production of the Tobago Festivals Network. Of course, the Blue Food Festival Special Edition. The step-by-step -step Blue Food series is a production of the Tobago Festivals Commission Limited in partnership with the Tobago House of Assembly. Thank you very much for tuning in and we'll see you next time on the Blue Food Step-by-Step -step series.